Good morning. Today is Palm Sunday, also known as the Sunday of the Passion, a day in which we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, only to be saddened by his death, his crucifixion, five days later on Good Friday. After our first hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor, we will have the shortened version of the Passion Gospel read, which comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 54, followed by the sermon and ending with two hymns that will help you to reflect on today and the coming days ahead in Holy Week.
passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? When he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Having nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. Then the people and the host answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene called named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two of the bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saves others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, wet my sabachthani, that is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some, of the, when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, 
They were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. In the name of the one true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We all have our favorite television shows and movies that we watch over and over again. Even though we know it's going to happen, we still enjoy watching either out of nostalgia or because we enjoy the characters. You can go about your daily routine while the show airs because you know that nothing will surprise you. However, there is one story that should never become routine no matter how many times you hear it. That is how it is for me in the story of the Passion. No matter how often I hear the Passion Gospel or read it, it always makes me stop and take pause. It feels like you are right there with Jesus in the midst of everything that is going on with him and around him. And no matter how often I hear the story or read it, it still seems new. It never gets old. Several, several years ago, a, a movie depicting the passion of Jesus made headlines across the world. It was called The Passion of the Christ, directed by Mel Gibson. Although there have been several movies made about Christ's passion before, this movie garnered a lot of buzz for its overly, for, for its overly realistic depiction of the final hours of Jesus. The film primarily covers the final 12 hours of Jesus' life, beginning with the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the grievance of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the, the, the brutal scourging, crucifixion, and death of Jesus, and ending with a brief depiction of his resurrection. There were reports of people crying in the theaters, fainting, or even having heart attacks while viewing this film. Among the many criticisms of the film was that it was too graphic, too brutal, that the violence depicted on screen was unnecessary. By the time I saw the film, it was on DVD, and I viewed it on my laptop. I will admit that it was a lot to take in, and cannot imagine seeing it on the big screen. It is not a movie that I have watched over and over again, but it is one that has stayed with me. The passion of Jesus Christ is not only something that we should hear over and over again, it is also something that we should carry with us always. It is easy to hear or read the story once a year and tuck it away until the next Palm Sunday. However, if you carry the story and the image of the crucified Christ with you throughout the year, both in your heart as well as in your thinking, you should come away with a better understanding of the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for all of humankind. The final hours of Jesus were not neat and pretty, they were brutal and torturous. I have to wonder if the people who supposedly fainted and had heart attacks during the viewing of the movie had really truly thought about what it was like for Jesus and also what it was that Jesus did for them. Those who said that it was too graphic, too violent, I cannot help but wonder, do you think that it was pleasant? Jesus chose to fulfill the mission given to him by God, even though he knew that he would have to die in order for others to live. Even in the midst of it all, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many have wondered if this was a lack of faith on the part of Jesus. Why would he cry out if he already knew what was going to happen? The cry of Jesus to God shows us that even in the midst of what it seemed like unbearable suffering, it is human nature to question God and at the same time to, to stay faithful to him and to his plan for our lives. Jesus had the power to save himself, but chose not to do so. He chose to see his journey through and not turn his back on God or those whom he was sent to save. Jesus' cry should assure us that it is natural to cry out to God when, when you feel that God has abandoned you in your time of need. Sometimes we have to be shaken from our comfort zones in order to realize the reality of what is around us and to what God has in store for us. Your strength and faith in the midst of uncertainty could be what someone needs to see in order to strengthen their faith and or belief in God, just as the centurion came to see and speak when he heard the cry of Jesus. There could be someone watching you to see how you handle crisis, disappointment, betrayal, abandonment, and loss. What, what would you like for that person to see? Faith and hope or doubt and despair? During this week, holiest of weeks, what is it that you want to say to God? 
What if he felt like crying out but stopped himself because he did not want to question God? Jesus' cry on the cross gives you permission to cry out to God as well. Jesus did not give up hope, and neither should we. Even in the midst of what seems like darkness, the light of Christ is always there. It is always there if you carry him and his journey with you daily and not just one Sunday out of the year. Take a little time this Holy Week to reflect on the life and death of Jesus. Reflect on the love that Jesus had for you by dying on the cross, the hope that his life means to you, and the freedom that his cry grants you in times of trouble and sadness. On this most holy of weeks, cement the passion gospel into your heart and into your mind so that it can never be forgotten or catch you by surprise because you have become immune to hearing it. And let it not become routine like one of your favorite television shows or movies, but remain fresh and relevant in our life now and forever. Amen.